Good evening and welcome back to the shop here in Canterbury, New Hampshire. This quiet little corner of the world. It's a beautiful place. You'll have to come up and see it sometime. <laughs> but we are grateful to have you there virtually hanging out in the shop. We have these big double doors in the back, these big mahogany doors. And I can just envision you walking in and sitting right here. So anyway, I'm glad you're there. And tonight, we're going to talk about making designer plywood. Plywood. Plywood's like um, had a bad name in the custom furniture world like that I've been immersed in for 30 years. Um, not because it's bad necessarily, but, you know, so much of the period furniture was made with solid wood. So it almost felt like you were cheating or skimping on the recipe if you used some prefabricated laminated plywood. But it's not really cheating. And there are cases where it's actually preferred. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about not only the virtues of plywood, but making your own incredible plywood, not having to rely on the store-bought stuff. So, well, sort of partially. I don't know, I've got to qualify that. But we're going to get into that in a second. I just want to... Uh, Mention that if you enjoy this content, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell and sharing and liking and all that. It helps with our channel and it doesn't really annoy you or cost you a thing. So, in fact, you'll get to know more about what we're doing. And also, if you want to go deeper with what we're doing here, you can check us out at epicwoodworking.com. We've got quite a few courses there and we're knee deep in one right now. We're we're uh, working through the, what are we calling it? The Modern Writing Desk. And uh, check this out. We're going to pan right over here. The camera lady is doing one of her classic pans. And this is not finished, obviously. It's not, the front assembly is glued up, but it's not been glued up front to back. And the class this Saturday, we're going to be doing that. This top is actually temporary, but... I'm really pleased with how it's looking, and there's a lot of little subtleties and experiences along the way that you go through when you build a custom design piece like that. And what I love about this teaching format is that it's as real as it gets, and it's just, it's the experience that I had when I apprenticed, basically. Um, I'm trying to pass that along to you. So, I mean, you could go to a school and it sounds like I'm plugging a big commercial, but I actually, this is spontaneous. <laughs> I actually truly feel this. I, you could go to a school, and I actually checked out schools before I went and apprenticed with Pug Moore, and it was just so much money. It was like going back to college again, and I thought, I'm not going back to college. <laughs> but, uh, or you could find a, you know, a master craftsman or something to work with, and that's hard to do because it's hard to get paid and have them pay you. You're going to have to pay them. That's why these schools cost like going to college, like $20,000, $30,000 a year. And look, you could take these classes with me and you are going to get the same or better in some ways this immersion. If you just hang out, just stay with me, okay? It's like, it's like I'm trying to stay with learning the guitar right now. Just trying to hang out in that because I'm not... It's all new to me, but I'm starting to make a few decent notes. <laughs> but anyway, you might notice these planks up here in the back. These are actually going to be on the top of this modern writing desk. I'm really psyched for this material. So this is, this is just kind of a stand-in piece of uh, curly. It's not the best. I mean, it would sort of almost work, but... I wanted something that looked like clouds, you know, that would make you inspired to sit at this writing desk and have the breakthrough that you're looking for, or just totally waste time surfing online. All right, but these two kinds of material, this is uh, flame birch. It's considered yellow birch. It's the white 
uh, sapwood of the birch tree. Um, when you see red birch, it's a red flame. It's basically the same tree. It's just the heartwood. So I don't know if we have any red on these. Now we got a little darker. But anyway, that's kind of, that's going to be kind of pillowy and uh, cloud-like. And then this is big leaf modeled figure maple. Outstanding. I mean, I've got two more boards like this. So this is a little less of the cloud in terms of the whiteness, and that's okay. It's really more of a, um, it's got more of an amber tone to it, almost like a wheat color brown. So, uh, but I'm excited to see how that figure is going to pop as we get the finish on there. But uh, if you're not part of the course, I'll share what it looks like at the final end. But look, if you really want to experience it, you can jump in now. You can do that on our website. And, um, but wait, there's more. No, actually, that is it. <laughs> no, you can jump in on the website. And the videos are, have been recorded. So you're really not late. You know, you could come in and you could catch up because we've had four sessions. Everything's recorded to go through nice and slow. All right, enough of that. But part of that course, I have to make some panels for the drawer bottoms. And I was thinking about that and how useful it is to be able to make your own plywood. Because I was almost going to make solid drawer bottoms in there like a traditional method, but decided to go more contemporary. Because this is a contemporary piece, and you won't have to worry about Wood movement. What do I mean by wood movement? Well, if you're new to woodworking, you may wonder what I mean by that. I know this is a little repetitive for some of you, but I'm going to go through it fast. Don't worry. And uh, we need a little refreshing. This is a piece of uh, veneer, walnut veneer. I just want to do a quick little demonstration for you. You can see by the lines in it that the grain is running this way. That's the length of the tree, or the tree is growing tall like this. And then these kind of lines here are just the various cut-throughs of the growth rings. So all those circular rings cut right through. So right in the middle, we're tangential to the rings. So we get that flat cathedral kind of wide bands, also called flat sawn in that area. Then you start getting away, and these are more getting kind of the cross or angular cross cut of the ring. So we're more in the rift sawn here. And then as you get out wide, you're in the quarter sawn, perpendicular or radial to the growth rings. All right, so anyway, the theory is that wood expands and contracts, and it's more than a theory, it really does happen. That's why your doors sometimes get stuck and whatever. But that it expands and contracts across the grain, but not, or very hardly at all, along the length. So if I wet this piece, it would hardly grow this way, but we would expect it to expand some this way. Almost like a sponge, you know? All those fibers, they grow wide, but they're long fibers like this, and they're very kind of stable in this long direction almost like drinking straws. So just to verify, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, doing a magic trick here or anything. But just look down here. You can see that this panel, this is the same length as this piece right in here. OK? And then I'll flip it around. And it's actually the same length. Nobody's, nobody's come up here and moved it. The camera lady <laughs> has not slipped in unseen. Nope, this is the same. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> no, it's still the same. All right? I'm not, I'm seriously. I do like magic, but I'm not much of a magician. I know we have people on here who are into that. Yes, we I'm, do. I'm really excited that you watch this because... As a kid, I would put on some pretty lame magic acts. <laughs> but they know who they are. Anyway, I've got this piece, and I'm going to wet it, okay, on both sides. 
with, I'll just missed it. You can almost, watch what happens. Look at it. I just missed it. And look at what's happening to it. It's curling up. I'm not doing that. It's because it's expanding on just that side. Look at it moving. Okay? We got to get it on the inside to make that catch up. Now, this is extreme moisture hitting this thing. But, you know, in the humidity of the summer, look how it's flattening out again. I didn't do anything. So now it's catching up. And we've got like this expansion happening right before your eyes. <laughs> right? Magical. <laughs> so this is, this is what happens when the seasonal uh, humidity changes. In the summer, we get all that humidity. And all those fibers just kind of slowly absorb the moisture in the air. And it expands this way. But hardly at all along the length. So let's check it out. All right, we could give it longer to adjust, but we're in a hurry. So I'll just check it along the length, and look, it's the same. It's like the scantest bit longer, but it's virtually the same. We're going to turn it across the grain. We expect it to grow slightly, and it's up to an eighth of an inch. Look at that. Pretty fast, huh? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wet it a little more. We, we'll give it a little more time here. I'll come back to it in a second. Okay, I want to give it more time because it'll even go more than that. All right, let's let that saturate in there. All right, so that's what happens. Wood is expanding and contracting, and it's fine. Like that's you can use it and use methods in your construction to get along with the wood so that you're accommodating for the expansion and contraction. And that's what a lot of period furniture is. So when we do that shaker chest of drawers course next month, there's a lot of elements in the construction of that that are very aware and designed in to accommodate for the wood movement. It's a very traditional way. And so on that chest, I'm not going to use any kind of plywood or anything. We're going to be solid wood throughout. All of the techniques involved are just good old honest traditional techniques that are accommodating for the wood movement, the seasonal wood movement of expansion and contraction. So that's another one you can check out online if you hadn't heard about that already. That should be awesome. And it's going to be featured in the next issue of Fine Woodworking Magazine coming out in early June. So you can check that out. Anyway, um, so what's the difference? What does plywood do for you? Well, plywood is a much more stable version, version of wood made of multi-plies or layers of wood. And the way it's created is these are all equal pieces of 16th inch uh, poplar. So uh, this is the heart, the kind of greenish tint, and the sap here. But I cut them all roughly square to each other here. And just to show you, this is the way that plywood is made. They start with an internal layer, the center layer. And it doesn't really matter which way you have it, because then it's made a sandwich of with the layer going on the bottom and above in the same direction, but opposite to that center layer. Okay, So we're crossing the grain. So now we got a sandwich. These two are going this way. The center is going that way. Then we keep building layers of the plies. We need more plies or laminated layers, whatever you want to call them. And this one goes again. You already figured it out. We're going opposite that one. Boom. And this one goes opposite that one. Now we got five layers on there. But every new layer is going the opposite. And we have kind of a balance starting to take shape because we're going the opposite and making a sandwich on each side of that center. So eventually, the layers overpower that center layer. And given that they're all so thin, none of the layers actually can overtake the previous. And you have all that glue surface in there. So 
the long grain being so stable along this length, it controls and it, and it holds back the other layers from expanding and contracting underneath. So just by alternating cross grain, every one, with a balance across the middle layer, you end up with this really nice stable piece of material. And that's basically every piece of plywood you look at is just a sequence of layers of plies glued up flat and it's real wood but it's it's uh, much more stable it's not going to change dimensionally so that's what's great it's you know it's great in building a house to put the skins around the house to put your subfloors down all that and and it's great in furniture because there's times you don't want to worry about things moving so we put that aside let's so check Ken let's, has a question about why plywood would warp then why plywood would what warps oh it does warp because there's imbalance like with some of the layers it's just not a perfect science you would have to have the exact same material on both sides it does still warp unfortunately some ply it's I mean it doesn't usually go really bad it depends on the grade and the quality of the plywood I'll show you some different grades in a second but there's some that stay flatter than others but it's still real wood so there are still you know moving factors going but dimensionally it's staying very true it may get weird a little bit depending on the type but dimensionally it's stable okay so once you nail it down or fasten it or get it inside the piece you kind of take away the, the warping factor you don't have to worry about the dimension changing that's the main feature all right let's come back to our saturated piece let's see if it grew any more than the eighth wow look at that I didn't switch this piece out <laughs> you get a little ruler see how much we changed here I think we would have seen you do that. That's the magic, though. That's the deception. <laughs> <laughs> Not deception, the sleight of hand. The illusion. Yeah. Anyway, we're almost a half an inch wider across the grain there. But look at this. We're going to go back this way. And we're still the same. Actually, if I measure that, it's about a 64th grown in length so wow it does slightly change but it's not enough that's a lot of water on there right what's going on i'm just laughing because i think it's so good to know that 64th occurred <laughs> uh, so does this plywood absorb water at all i mean you get moisture yeah i mean it it's feeling it but because it's so kind of uh balanced in terms of the the composition with it you're alternating every layer like that the, it's holding itself back from changing think every layer every glue layer would have to fail for that to change in one direction because it's fighting against it and it just doesn't because the layers are so thin there's not like enough power but imagine if you tried to make a plywood out of two inch thick material I mean, that would exert tremendous force against the other. You'd probably have cracks appearing in the core. But because they're so thin, they're not strong enough to overcome the, the cumulative cross-grain glue-ups of the whole stack. Okay? hope I explained that well enough. But uh, anyway, that's my little demo for plywood. Let me just show you a few versions of plywood these are just cutoffs I had of various things um, here's a piece um, let me see if I can so if you can zoom in on that you can see check this out it's got one layer in the center there and this stuff is pretty thick layers they're an eighth inch okay so that center layer is an eighth then you have these two layers, they're both the same color because the grain is running this way. You can see that's long grain. This is end grain I'm looking at in the middle. So that's coming this way. And then the, just the little skin veneer, this on the top is only about, you know, it's a regular veneer thickness. It's like a 42nd of an inch. 
it's running cross grain to that. So this would be, it's like a three ply layer, but you have that final sheet of veneer on each side. So that's pretty basic. This is, this is a kind of veneer uh, plywood that will warp more readily because it's only got three cores, you know, three layers. But it's pretty, it's still going to be super stable. And sometimes you'll see the cheapness of the wood. You'll see voids in here. And, you know, it's like a crappy kind of core material like this. This is more construction grade plywood, okay? This is for like subfloor or something like that. Look at that void right there. Look at that. That ruler goes all the way in. There's, a, there's almost three inch deep cavity in here. So they're not really caring that much. But that first layer is running the long grain here, and that's end grain here. This is some type of pine. And then it has this outer layer that's running this way. So all the layers are about the same thickness. They're all about 3 seconds of an inch. And this is a five ply. And it's, it's construction grade subfloor material. So that stays pretty flat, pretty strong. But it's not, you wouldn't want to use this in furniture because of the poor quality of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, here's one. This was actually a piece of a $100 sheet of plywood, just a 4x8 sheet. It was veneered with cherry on the outside. I bought this years ago when I made a, uh, uh, some cabinets for some on a built-in cabinets that were cherry. And they, I almost never did this, but they were not, they were not the finest. So I could, there were some areas where I could use like the internal sides. I didn't have to, didn't have to worry about the quality of the veneer. I mean, it was really, good veneer, but I wasn't veneering this myself. I was trusting the veneer that it came. So usually have one side that's better when you buy plywood like that. This is faded so much. But you can see right, maybe you can't see it, but there's a seam right here. And see how this pattern right here is mirrored right here. That's because it was book matched, like the leaves of a book. We talked about that before. So you have a book match there, and then you have another book match right in here of the other side. So those pieces of veneer are almost, they're a little over six inches wide. That's not bad, you know, like you have some nice veneer across here. But by alternating and book matching every other leaf, you end up getting a nice kind of harmonious surface there, and that's a higher grade. But the core of this, uh, shoot, I forget what this was veneer core, I think it's called, um, is very nice kind of higher grade material for cabinetry. Look how nice quality those layers are. Each one is an eighth of an inch, um, even a little more than an eighth of an inch, actually. So these dark lines you see, those are end grain, and this is the side grain. It's all the same material, pretty much, but you have end grain and side grain you're looking at. So this would be also a five ply with um, cherry veneer on the exterior. So it's long, and then the cherry is going to go opposite that fifth ply, like the outer center ply. So that's a pretty nice piece of plywood. And could be, so you'll, you'll generally pay if you get a nice veneer on there, like a walnut or a cherry over $100 for just one sheet of plywood. And right now, plywood's crazy like at the builders, you know, at, with all the prices going through the roof, all the lumber prices, plywood's getting up there too. But uh, then there's some other grades that are even more stable. Here's a, just a quarter inch sheet of plywood, and it's a, only a quarter inch, but it's got the center, one, two, three, four, five, and then the veneer pieces on the outside. So this also is a five ply, just like this. This is five ply, three quarter inch. This is five ply, quarter inch 
or also called six millimeter, right? Yeah, three millimeter is, is the eighth inch ply. So this is a uh, nice material. Let me double check that. I almost never use the millimeters and I'm pretty sure that's right. No, I had that wrong. Yeah, I had that right. See, even when I think I'm <laughs> wrong, I'm actually right. You have folks watching from <laughs> Australia. I know, I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to get that messed up. <laughs> so this is six, six millimeter, but you can do the eighth inch also you can get. Now this is called Baltic plywood, and it's a nicer, higher grade because you have more layers. Look how many, I mean, you've got, so this is just, I feel more reassured with this that it stays quite stable. The core is always beautiful, but it does still get out of shape a little bit. But this feels really strong. Now, this piece, this is a little different. I'm not going exhaustively into all the plywoods. This is actually a piece of high grade bending plywood, and it's only a three layer. So you've got the center core. See that one little fiber going down the middle? Let me see if I can measure this in imperial. Wow, it's almost, it's like they're, each layer is just a, a little over a 30 second. So overall, it's actually under an eighth. So you've got three layers, but the center layer is going this way, and the two outer layers are going this way. So it bends really easy. The, the outer layers are easy to bend this way. So it's quite flexible, but it's a very nice high grade. It's smooth, it's not ripply at all. And this is often sold as Italian bending ply, eighth inch Italian bending ply. And I love this when I'm gonna laminate material up. But just by veneering this with the grain going opposite that last way, so you'd have to veneer on both sides to recreate the stability. Once you do that, even this veneer, this uh, bending ply gets more, less flexible and it'll get quite close to rigid. So anyway, I'm gonna set these aside for a second and just show We've you now. i got a question. Uh, I yeah. think you answered one of the questions now. Uh, Mike, Mr. Mike says, what do you think about solid wood core ply besides its cost? Did you kind of address that already? Um, no, I don't have an example of that. I, I don't use that that much, Mike, but I, yeah, I, I really like it a lot. It's solid wood core. It depends, again, there's various grades of it, but if it's thinner strips, it's, what we're talking about is a core that's thicker. You have all these thinner strips glued up and then sandwiched between thicker veneer going the other way. That stays, that tends to stay flatter. So that's one of the nice advantages. Lots of times, um, like the nicer quality uh, doors are built with solid core. They actually create like a solid core lamination of the styles going up and down. Because you need a door, can't twist at all. And that also creates flat, more stable panels that are less likely to expand and contract. So your really high quality doors are actually veneered core, but they're, there's a high grade of veneer. So you have wood. I'll talk more about, some night we'll get into other various plywoods, but I just wanted to show you the basic idea of plywood being laminated. So. I have another question. Yeah, quick. go ahead. Not, I don't know how comfortable you are talking about this part, but Chris is curious, can mention be made of glue and formaldehyde and VOC outgassing, please? Do you know what I mean? Um, uh, you know what, um, I have to say I don't know a lot about how much off-gassing you're going to get with your standard plywoods. I'm not, most of it seems quite stable when, when I get it. In my hands, I don't notice any kind of off-gassing. Um, so I can't speak to the various brands, how that works, but I can talk about the glues that I'm gonna use and that there is some off-gassing. If you do use the urea formaldehyde glue, that 
will uh, you will get some at first, but then it's going to cure hard, and it pretty much stops after after it reach reaches full properties or cure rate, which is usually just a week uh, with most glues like that. However, I don't know in the factory setting, and who knows? You know, you got we have a lot of import plywood, so I'm not sure what kind of controls they have in in that re realm, where I know the American regulations here in the US are pretty stringent as far as you know what it can be and can't be. However, I'm not sure if those same regulations are applied to imported. I know that you know we get a lot of we get a lot of uh, plywood in the box stores. If you look at it, it's actually Asian sourced. So there are woods there that I don't recognize, you know? I don't know what they are, but they're, they're basically the soft woods that are probably quite common in parts of Asia. But, um, and I'm not sure how, how OSHA approved their glue methods are. But anyway, um, but I can talk about what we're gonna do tonight. So you could start all the way from the base core and build your own veneer, you know, like, I showed you with the five layers. Just start like that and build it up and press it. That's kind of costly though, because you gotta ha you gotta make all these laminations. So the core laminations, I've got five 16th inch layers. I had to buy that stock, and that comes pre dimensioned. Like there are veneer at the veneer dealers, you can get special thickness veneers, and so the 16th inch thick is available, and that's what I got there. And I do use this for certain laminating times. And I have made my own plywood out of it in different times. But it's kind of a hassle because you've got to glue all those layers up. Usually I prefer it when I'm making curves or something. But that's more labor intensive. So what I'm going to show you tonight is actually um, using the help of a pre, using a pre-made veneer, I'm sorry, plywood. And we're going to actually just veneer a piece of quarter inch Baltic birch ply. Uh, and I'll show you some variations of that after, but we'll just, for demonstration purposes, we're going to create our own unique plywood skin out of a piece of quarter inch Baltic birch. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, there's cases where you want a special plywood and you just can't get it. Like we did this project a while back what do we call this, the serving tray mm -hmm. episode? Mm -hmm. I should have told you. I forget that. the name of it, but we can link to it later. We'll link to that in the notes, but we made this whole serving tray through, it wasn't just one, it was a couple different Shop Night Lives, I think, right? On Shop Night Live, we made this serving tray, and it was really a fun night because I made one of my first big mistakes live on camera, so you've got to go check that out and see what it was. I didn't hurt myself or anything, but it was embarrassing because of how I got something wrong. <laughs> but anyway, I, of course, I did that on purpose because I'm always trying to pass on how to respond to errors. Right? Of course, honey. Whatever you say. <laughs> <laughs> You're the camera lady. You, you always know how to get out of it, figure it out. That's true. All right, so we made this in that uh, course this base is actually just eighth inch masonite. So it wasn't even like plywood, but it was masonite that had some fairly good flex to it, but veneered it on both sides and it got kind of rigid and it's very strong. It doesn't feel like it's gonna move at all, yet it's only, it's less than 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. So it was really a nice way to create a custom made, beautiful, base to this. So you're not at the mercy of how the plywood dealer might sell it to you. Like you may or may not get a good piece. Like you may have these smaller strips of veneer veneering across it. But you can control and with species and the width and all that and make a really kind of designer veneer. You could even make a patchwork if you wanted. You could do all kinds of things. So we made this and um, I saw Bob's, Bob's trays are excellent, and we were talking 
about it that how much more rigid the base got after just applying that veneer on both sides. You do get this strengthening of the base. So let me set that aside. Tom, where do you get that one, that masonite that you use typically for jigs? Um, I get it at a plywood dealer at, um, it's called, around here, it's in Manchester, New Hampshire. It's called Goodfellow Plywood. But on the eastern seaboard, there's Atlantic Plywood. They're quite good um, for all kinds of plywood. You can look up some of those other versions we, talk, we were talking about, like solid core, lumber core, and all that. Uh, when we get to some more crazy uh, tops, we'll, we'll get into some other versions of plywood. But I'm going to set all these aside now. And we're going to make a little panel. Now the cool thing about this kind of designer plywood is that you can create your own. You can use this awesome material here. Oh, I forgot to show you. This is a piece of 3 quarter inch Baltic birch cut off. You know what? I forget how many layers are. I think it's 11. This is three-quarter inch, so when you get a sheet of three-quarter or, what is that? That's 18-millimeter um, Baltic birch, you get, you get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's 13. Yeah, thir seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thirteen layers make that, and every other layer is going the opposite making the sandwich. So I always feel like I'm using a great stable plywood. Stable doesn't mean it's going to stay dead flat. In fact, if you lean it in your shop in a way that it's kind of flexing, it's going to curve on you. So I always try to store it as straight as I can. But you know, when the air gets to it around it, it still will bend a little bit sometimes. Sometimes it'll stay dead flat for you. And this stuff comes in half inch thick as well, or 12 meter, millimeter. All right. Okay, so check out just, just a couple of these veneers. This is um, Riff Sawn White Oak. So it's got that same kind of wheat color, but a beautiful kind of combed texture. Look at it next to the big leaf maple. A similar kind of tone. This has a little more reddish. Curious how that's going to look. But what a different look. It's just got that linear straight grain to it. So you think design-wise differently, like in which cases you might use this. And then we've got some really flashy bird's eye veneer. I mean, look at how busy that is. That's insane how wild that is. And here's its cousin, curly maple. That, that is like fiddleback. Can you see that iridescence? Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, that. I run my fingers. I can feel it rolling. But this would be like you normally see on a guitar body or something where you'd have that top layer of an electric guitar would be book matched with a quarter inch thick curly maple. Or better yet, if you're more sophisticated, you see this on violins, you know, the back of a violin or a cello. You know, it's just outstanding. Of course, there they're using solid material. It's thin, but it is solid and not, but this is the veneer equivalent of a fiddleback, and that's why they call it fiddleback. So then you have dark kind of exotic woods like this wenge. This is quarter sawn, beautiful, like, combed again like the riffs on white oak but tight green lines and really a fibrous beautiful wood no, try not to spit on it okay <laughs> so <laughs> don't sit in the front row around here <laughs> just kidding i don't do that too often do i all right so I'll never tell <laughs> <laughs> Why do you wear that face shield? <laughs> <laughs> so um, for tonight, what I want to do is an actual panel that I need for a project that I've had going on 
for a little bit and it's it's the back of this cabinet so this cabinet is um, it's an example of one that we did on the first season of classic woodworking where the entire cabinet was made of various types of ash as kind of a tribute to the ash being wiped out by the emerald ash borer so the top and the sides were made from solid can you guess what kind of wood that what kind of grain that is you look at the end grain see the growth rings running perpendicular it's quarter sawn ash so that's why you have all this linear grain all the way around and it's solid linear this is american ash and i did this thing where i made the dovetails proud and really exaggerated it so that when you look at it from the front it just looks like part of the molding when you come to the side you actually see they're protruding dovetails holding the case together so this has an inset door which curves around and that door gets veneered and I used a veneer that was a little different this kind of this is a singular piece of ash but look at how beautiful wild figure that is it's crazy so that that's what I plan to use on the door but the back that's going to get set inside I'm going to cut a relief here like a rabbit all around after it's glued up using a router I won't get into that right now but so the back panel is going to be fit in there so I want a panel that's going to stay dead stable and fill that opening and I also want it to have some kind of visual interest when you open this door you're going to see another type of ash in there. And if I can make it out of a singular piece, that would be awesome. So check this out. I had this in my store of wood. I, this is some Japanese ash that I got from a, a veneer craftsman, a, a great craftsman down in the southwest part of the state. And he... he uh, sold me very inexpensively a lot a small lot of this and various other veneers and look at how crazy this is look at the growth rings in the middle so this is the plain saw in center and then you have all of the growth rings as you run out this way look how tight they are here well I did a little count in every one of those little hash marks I don't know if you can see those can you see them yeah those, I little think so. marks? those represent 10 growth rings or 10 years of growth and starting from the middle all the way to the outside there's 195 years wow. 195 rings and we're not even actually to the full exterior of this and I got this about 10 years ago from him and he had had it for quite a few years so when you think of it in those terms these rings that you are looking at right here <laughs> not my head rings <laughs> these rings we're looking at right here in the center are the late 1700s oh. so when you open that cabinet I was thinking it'd be pretty cool you're like looking back in time to the late 1700s right while they're probably drawing up the Constitution the United States so I thought I would look around for a good section and just use this one down here so I'm gonna grab a piece of plywood here's a veneer um, this is a quarter inch ply this is a little oversized for the back so it could be sawn to fit and this will be on the face of that but rather than measuring it out and everything I've got a check coming up there I'm gonna have this nice cathedral I like that that'll be about in the center so I'm just gonna set this in the center and cut I'm just gonna knife around it right here um, make it quicker that way where's my knife I think I got it under here <laughs> yeah all right so I'm just gonna knife this one we won't get across the entire 195 years but crazy to think how, how
how old this is. I'm going to just use a straight edge and finish that all the way across. So you can knife across wood like this if you want. You can use a knife to cut it quickly. But when I'm going with the grain, I prefer, here's the center. I'm going to eyeball it to the center of my panel. And then the same at the bottom. So I'm going to just make a pencil line on the sides here. And this side. And we'll go across the bottom. We'll spin her around. Now, again, I'll, I can knife across the fibers here. The knife works fine there. Technically, that's your scalpel, right? Yeah. You can use a scalpel or a utility knife. But here when I'm with the long grain, the knife can sometimes lose track because it wants to ride out. So most of the time, I'm using a traditional veneer saw, which has these small teeth on it. And it's sawing the wood so it doesn't get sidetracked. And I'm just lightly scoring. See, it's got these little teeth on it. See those teeth? Mm -hmm. And it makes a nice fine cut. And then we flip it around, get the other side. And there we go. We've got our, our panel. Tom, can you talk about how you store the long pieces of veneer in your shop? Lupe is asking. It's how I store veneer. Long, long pieces of veneer. Yeah, I was. Um, I have some that are just all stacked up on top of some boards in a pile. But then I, I actually built some shelving down in one corner of my shop downstairs, and I've got these shelves that are 12 feet long. So, uh, and they're only about that far apart, and they go up for nine feet. So I have them all laying in there, all the various varieties, um, you know, and these were in there. So the shelves are about 14 inches deep. It'd be nice if they were deeper because this is even wider. I mean, this is crazy wide. I almost feel guilty for cutting it like this, but check out what we end up with. We end up with this gorgeous singular piece of Japanese ash that is... This is like the late 1700s. Isn't it crazy? So who would know that? I think only you know that now. Most people won't appreciate looking back in time <laughs> So they open that door. All right, so I'm going to set aside that. Now on the back of the cabinet, I don't really care so much. I'm not going to use that premium ash back there. I'm going to use... Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I'm going to use some maple. This won't be seen. It'll be against the wall. And so let's just cut a little of this. And again, I'll just use my actual blank to help me speed it along. Set it right at the end here. And we'll use the knife. Just cut right across there. Nice. And now we don't quite have the full width, so we're going to need one more cut. And we'll have to tape this up. I wish it was wide enough, but uh, we'll, we'll just tape a seam here, and I'll show you making a seam. If you haven't seen that before, set that aside. Okay, so now we've got that ready, um, but we've got to make a seam here. So this is the way it came off. I could, by using this grain, is continuing right here. If I swing this around, 
I could bring it over and have almost a perfect match. But a lot of times the grain is reversing and you end up seeing that more than you think. So I try, if possible, to do what's called a slip match, to slip it over the other side and find where the grain looks similar. So I'm just going to go right about there. Actually, you know what, in, in this case, I think I'll, I'll stick with the, the come around. We'll get a, a less visible joint. And it's on the back. I'm not going to fuss with it too much. And I'm going to use this straight edge. And here I'm going back to the veneer saw. So this is nice and straight piece of MDF, about six inches wide. I jointed the edge to give me a true surface and I'm just making light strokes start out with the flat back flat against the straight edge and there you go you got a nice straight cut now we can flip this around and get a similar cut right here there we go so now these two edges come together and I'll get some tape. I'm just going to use cheap masking tape. You can, I do have veneer tape, but for something small like this, this is actually quite adequate and it's thin and it won't, you got to make sure you get thin tape. And so this less expensive veneer um, masking tape works great. It comes off easier than the veneer tape too but Tom Nate's asking did you modify your veneer saw or are you using it the way it came um, I I put a new handle on it who's that Nate Nate yeah yeah Nate I put a new handle on it and I've sharpened it numerous times so that's all the changes I made now if you want to see that handle making we did a video on that I forget what that one was called, but that's a Wenge handle. It comes with a much cheaper looking handle. You can, you can buy those fairly inexpensively. So I'm just using the tape like stitches across the seam like this. I'll hold it down and I kind of pull it across, stretching the tape a little bit to make sure it really pulls that joint tight. You see how it just in, goes invisible. Again, pull it right across. And the nice thing about veneer tape, the actual veneer tape, is it's paper and it's thin and it's got an incredibly tacky glue on it, which makes it really hard to get off. But it, as it dries, because it's more of a paper-based, um, it shrinks and makes sure that that joint stays tight. But just by stretching this a little, you get a similar effect and it works just fine in most cases. There we go. And now once you've got it all stitched across nice and tight, then I take one that goes the full length. Just set it right, straddling the joint there. Pull it out. Now that's got us enough. And now we can cut. I'll get rid of some of that gunky looking material on that side. Cut that off, and we got plenty of material here. I angled it a little bit by mistake. Let me get that squared up. There we go. That's good. And that's a cut. There we go. Now we got our, our veneer ready. I'm going to go right into gluing this. We'll show you how quickly this can go when you're ready to go. Got a straight edge out of the way. And I've got my roller ready to go. I just used it earlier today. 
So wrapped it in a plastic bag with the roller inside there. Of course, I dropped it, <laughs> knocked it off the shelf, so it went upside down, and hopefully the glue didn't go everywhere. But sophisticated system you have there, sir. Well, you know, it works. We spare no expense, nothing but the best. Here we go. All right, so I'm going to set that side and this is the, the bag the veneer bag we're going to use I'll show you that first so it's just a manual bag it's going to go in there and it's going to create a vacuum so we're going to set the piece on a platen or a flat in this case it's just a flat piece of MDF that'll go in the bag so it'll be sitting on there this is a manual bag from Wool Rocket that you can uh, you can get. We'll put a link to that as well. Um, the once the veneer goes in, then we put. I mean, the veneer panel will have a call over the top of it. That's this. I've got a quarter inch piece of masonite that will go on the top, and that'll distribute the pressure nice and evenly on the veneer that's going to be wanting to curl up, and then this little uh, mesh goes on top of that and it allows the vacuum to pull and distribute across the whole thing down because the vacuum is coming from the top. I'll, I'll, I'll show you all that as we go, but that's the lineup. And now we are going to get some glue on our panel. Can you talk about the choice of hide glue when you're veneering? Is that an option? Yeah. Who's asking? Who's asking? Tim. Tim, yeah. Hide glue is an option. Um, if you're using real hide glue, that's kind of cool because you don't actually even have to put it in a press, but you use an old technique of hammer, hammer veneering. And, but it's, it's tricky. There's a learning curve with hide glue. And I, that's, it has its weaknesses, you know, because it does fail with water and it can pop off with humidity. But... It actually is an awesome glue, um, but once it cools, it it starts to grab. So that's the big variable when you're using high glue. It's hard to use on large flat surfaces. Um, there are there are types that are in liquid form, like old brown glue, and others that I haven't used a lot, but they're basically um, a type of hide glue. You can get liquid hide glue like in a bottle that will perform the same. It is hide glue, but I'm not sure what they do to it to get it to not solidify at room temperature because it will. As soon as it cools, it just goes on you. But I'm not do using the hammer veneer technique here, obviously. Oh, I forgot I had that on the bottom there. So that's perfect. So I'm going to now put this on top. This will be my back. Put that right on there. We'll flip it. We'll get the glue on the top. I'm right here. I'm using Type Bond Three, which works fine for a panel like this. It gives you more open time. Um, it's if you want absolutely uh, brittle glue, then you're gonna move into a glue like a a urea formaldehyde type base, unibond. Um, it's just, but I usually, I usually don't use that when I'm just putting on a skin like this. But for laminations and curves where you really want to be sure that curve stays right where it is, I'll use the unibond type urea formaldehyde glue. But this is just a quick job here. And this works great. We get just a small little roller, evenly distribute. We know we're cutting it down to size, so we're not really that stressed about the edges, although I'm making sure I get it out to the edges. All right, here we go. Now we get our finished piece of veneer. Oh, look at that. No tape on it or anything. That's a beauty. 
Nice. With that in position here, I'm going to get those pieces centered. I'm just going to put a piece of tape right around the center of each end just to keep that from slipping. I'll make a cut and then I'll just wrap it right around, hold the one on the bottom. Ooh, it's curling up big time underneath there. Same here. I could put some on the outside, but I think I can get it in the bag without worrying about that. Oh, let me not forget the call. I'll hit that with one more piece of tape. In the center. So that's it. We're just making a nice little sandwich here. And I'll hold that back from curling. And we get it into the bag. There we go. Beautiful. All right, that looks like it's going to be nice. And then we got to put the mesh in so that the vacuum will pull. And we'll get some atmospheric pressure going here. Now I could use this goopy stick, but I'm using this method that my friend Bruce, Bruce, are you watching? <laughs> Bruce Wedlock, yeah. I haven't seen him on here. He's not on there. Well, he. this is another way. You can avoid the goop, but if you make this little V channel, I just did this with the angle of the blade over at 45, you can create like a pinch on the bag instead of using the goopy thing. However, I have found it doesn't quite hold as well, um, which just made me realize I'm not going to be... I am going to use the goopy thing. If you put that on there, you just put it in here. Let me just show you. And the V goes on and like that. And then you're going to put a clamp on there. I usually put five of them. And then, but I did find that the vacuum was not staying totally up. I had to check it every 10 minutes or so. So let's try the goop on this one. This is a really sticky, this is what it comes with. And it feels like it's working. The mesh comes with the kit as well, right? Yeah, it's one full, this whole kit is like 70 bucks. And they're not sponsoring or anything There's like that. There's a couple people that are from Australia watching and they found a distributor there. Oh, cool. Roar Rocket. Yeah, they, they're doing great, I think. They're actually in Canada, right? Toronto, I think. Roll rocket? I'm not sure. All right, so I'm just trying to make sure that this gets stuck down. If you get a bubble, you'll notice right away. I might put a little clamp. I think I got, I'm going to have one right there. But that should do it. Let's pull the, a lot of the air out with the vacuum first. All right, then we'll finish with the well, I got a I can hear it hissing in the corner there. So I got a leak. I'm gonna have to <laughs> clamp. Oh. I need a clamp, doctor. Sorry, I didn't realize that pumping would make so much noise. So oh, to... sorry, was that too loud? I should have lowered that. <laughs> All right, so then we get this on. This will pinch that spot. Let's see if we still get leaking. I don't hear anything.
that's pulling a good vacuum right now. So, and I just leave that. You leave it for, I like to leave it for at least an hour, uh, longer if you can. And I've got this one I did earlier. Check this out. This one I did with the clamps so you can see how those go on. It's a little more cumbersome, but it worked pretty well. I didn't, I really messed up the goop on this bag. I doubled it up, so I got really, really wide. But uh, let's check it out, see what we got. Take it out of the oven. I haven't seen it yet, but see, same thing. We've got a call on the top. And there, look at that. That same Japanese ash. I wish I had the finished cabinet to show you, but I sold it not too long ago. I had one around here for a while. Uh, but I'm going to make, I'm going to finish a couple more. So who knows? If you look on our, what do we call it? Bow front Made cabinet. by Tom? Yeah. No. We don't have anything in the Made by Tom area oh, right nothing. now. But that is the, the, the uh, category on our store. Yeah, bow front. So the back, I could pull that off, but on the back of this one, I didn't use the maple. I used some of that riffs on white oak. It's against the wall anyway, but this is what you'll see when you open up the cabinet. So it'll be so wow, like that. That's so nice. So when you open it up, you'll see a one continuous piece of yeah. Japanese ash. Now the outside door, I just want to talk about that for a second. I'm not going to show you the laminating process, but this involved a, a curved laminated door because I wanted to have a door that was not solid wood that I had to worry about expansion and contraction because it's kind of set in here. I wanted it to stay perfect and the curve. You, there are ways of making them solid. However, I took five layers of, of that bending ply and glued, just rolled out the glue between all five layers and then put it in the press and pressed it over this curved form. This is the curve that's the same as the front of this face. So building a curved form like that is just a matter of putting these ribs in there with the curves and then skinning it over. I'll show you that at some point on some project. When we, we should get do a a course on that. Yeah, it's a little more advanced. Yeah, we could do maybe this cabinet, but it's, um, it's tricky. But uh, then once I laminated those, I ended up, I meant to keep that. The five layers gives you a panel like that. So that, look how that stayed dead flat. And I think I used the urea formaldehyde glue on that. But I mean, that is rock solid, dead flat. That, but now you still have the core, so you basically made your own plywood. It's like Baltic birch, almost exactly the same. When you cut this, it looks just like Baltic birch plywood. But it's only a, it's a little less than five eighths of an inch thick, and it's a custom made door to fit this opening. So what I do is I take it from this point and I cut it to size less the amount of a solid border because I don't want to see that, that plywood on the edge. And I end up edging it with ash like this. So you can see that edge was put on there. Just a solid piece right there glued on. And it's like an eighth of an inch. And then I did the edges here. So this would have to be brought down into plane with the curve which I would just do with like a block plane and clean it up. And then the same on the inside. So what you end up with is a solid edging. But when I sized this, I had to make sure that I sized it considering that edging. So it was basically sized a quarter inch less than the width and the vertical, also allowing for the gap or the reveal on the top and bottom. And then once you had that done, I veneered it with that material 
and end up with a door that looks like that. So here, it's the same principle we just went over. We basically made a custom piece of plywood door, but it's really high end because it's five layers of Italian bending ply, solid edging, and then a singular piece of this ash. It's almost like popcorn ash in there. That's, a, that's just American ash veneer. So we have this veneer ash on the door, and then that gets set in here with knife hinges, so they're hardly seen here and here. And that'll get cleaned up on the edges, but that'll get attached into this case, and you'll have this kind of veneer, beautiful veneer on this top. The sides are, are quarter sawn ash, and then you open the door, you've got this 200 year old Japanese ash. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's a kind of a, hopefully that was more just like an inspiration of how you can push this principle of making your own designer plywood into a curved form. And this whole idea got started because I had to make drawer bottoms for our modern writing desk. And I made these out of Italian bending ply, just a single layer, and then use that maple on both sides going across. And it's, it's really quite strong. And when that gets captured in the, in the groove, it's going to be the drawer bottom on this table. Check it out. We're going to have these little door, drawers. And when you open the drawer, you're going to see that beautiful maple there. And, um, but to see how I made this one and how it gets installed into the drawer, you have to be a part of this course. <laughs> and why wouldn't you want to be? <laughs> but we'll be making these. We'll be starting, actually, the drawers this Saturday. So we'll see how far we get. But hey, Tom, you said that the door was five ply. I used, I used five layers yeah. of the Italian bending. Okay. Yeah, let me double check that. Yes. So, yeah, I actually could count them right here. You can see. But it's funny, after you cut that, it's, uh, you can hardly even tell. I did the same thing, actually, on this Super Bowl trophy. So when I made this trophy, this base, this is the exact same thing. It's laminated curves. So I had to make, it's just like this door, except it was a different curve. And all of this, these, this is five layers of Italian bending plywood with an outer layer, a 16th inch thick of cherry. And then I mitered it and cut, you know, this taper, mitered it and then that got glued up to make the column. But it's the same process. This is just designer plywood. <laughs> you know, it was laminated, curved, around a form, and then on the hollow side, though, that's pretty unusual for me, and then you end up with a, a nice cove around like that. But the same principle. And then this is a whole other thing, <laughs> a solid, turning yeah I'll uh, I'll put a link to to the uh, video <coughs> what do they call that time-lapse video of you building that there's there's some turning in there somebody in here is asking about turning videos you might have done so I'll include that uh, I do have a question from Michael how does glue cure if it has no air that's you know what it is Michael I, I've thought of that too it actually does cure I mean it gets Quite hard. You saw, I just took out that panel. Um, it actually is a water thing. It's like the water, as the water gets absorbed into the fibers, it, it dries enough that the bond is, is uh, established. But um, yeah, that's kind of a good, that's a good question, but it, it definitely works. It, um, I was talking to a guy, a guy at Type Bond some years ago, and, and um, we were, it was about some kind of uh, strength of various joints and things, and uh, one of the comments he made was that the glue bond is actually formed once the water gets taken out, you know, so it, 
it's the water penetration or whatever into the fibers uh, with the adhesive whatever between there so once that's in it's it's solid so I'm not sure if it's as much an oxygen thing but somehow it does it works somebody will have to look into that uh, Charlie's asking when using the bending ply do all the layers run in the same direction uh, yes Charlie well technically they do and they don't um, but yeah you're usually bending around the form in the direction that it's comfortable bending so uh, this is not even the most bending ply like I had that single layer here earlier uh, well here's yeah so it wants to bend in one direction this way it's hard it's kind of stiff because two layers are going this way so it doesn't want to bend this way but in this direction the two layers are running the opposite way and so it's very kind of flexible here so yes I stack them all with that same orientation so the whole stack can bend around the form and then there's other types of bending ply like a lot of it you can buy typically it's about five sixteenths to three eighths of an inch and they call it wacky wood and that is like really funky flexible uh, plywood that when you build up layers you can make these really you know you make like columns and tubes and drums and things like that so it's kind of like a so many op options with um, what you can create using this technique cool all right um, yeah. Thomas is saying that he's had some tight bond uh, some bleed through with the tight bond three do you have anything to say about that I have not experienced that um, so I'm not sure I, I if I would I would have experienced it on a wood like this where you've got more open grain but um, I'm sure you get some bleed through here and there but I I'm sorry I can't speak better to that I know I know it can be an issue but um, I'm not sure with the specifics of type on three bleeding through and I guess you'd be concerned about it causing issues in the finishing process if I had any bleed through I'd make sure I card scraped it off in all those areas so that I'm taking it down and then sand and you'll be removing it from the surface but that's really gonna happen with a porous wood or an open grain wood similar to ash or or oaks or other woods that have uh, strong open grain whenever I'm veneering like maple like I just put on the back there you never see any bleed through because it's a close grain wood and it's just hardly any pores really to come through so but I'm I don't know I don't know that um, that, that'd be a good question for a type bond people who I'll, I'll try to remember to ask them that next time I see them is that it Steve's suggesting that we give the trophy to him so he can take it to the Akron Football Hall of Fame to put them on display there <laughs> that would be awesome Steve yeah good one <laughs> I don't have any more questions so okay we're good awesome well thank you all so much for visiting for this little bit of time here in the shop seems like the time goes by so fast you raising a finger I do have a question oh from Larry have you ever used Uniondale glue Uniondale no. I have not no I'm sorry I haven't I'm not, I've never even heard of it but that'd be good to know about you can um, send the link or something I'll I'll, I'll look it up okay. all right everybody well thank you so much for visiting with us here in the shop it's been great to have you for this short little time it seems to go by fast every week but I'm excited to uh, continue with our courses this Saturday if you're part of that I look forward to seeing you then but if you're not hey we look forward to seeing you next week right back here in the shop in Canterbury New Hampshire for shop night live <laughs> good night everybody <laughs> see you we later need to have some music or something that chimes in after you I know huh we gotta start getting more professional with that <laughs> see you later good night everyone Great to be with you.